Chapter One. The body. Inspector Barry Ainsworth considered the problem carefully. The general's body had been found in the dining room of the house. He had been shot through the heart with his own revolver. No one had broken into the house, and nothing had been stolen. Someone in the house must have killed him. But who? He looked again at the list of people who were in the house. Any of them could be the murderer. There was the general servant, Deakin. Everyone had heard the general shouting furiously at Deakin the day before the murder. What had they quarrelled about? The inspector wondered. Or was the murderer one of the general's sons, perhaps? They were a peculiar bunch. The inspector thought to himself. The eldest, Arthur, was the owner of an art gallery in London. He had beautiful clothes and he drove an expensive car. But the inspector had made his inquiries. He knew that the art gallery was losing money. Perhaps Arthur had asked his father for money, and the old man had refused to give it to him. Had Arthur killed him in a sudden outburst of anger? Then there was Reginald, the second son. Reginald certainly knew how to use a revolver. He was the editor of Gun Monthly. Reginald loathed his father. Everyone knew that. The two men had usually avoided each other. Why had Reginald come down to the house for the weekend? And what about the third son, the shy and innocent-looking Doctor Richard? The inspector had made inquiries about him as well. He knew that Richard gambled heavily. Was he in financial trouble too? Was that why he had come to see his father? It was a difficult case. The inspector said to himself. Suddenly, the answer came to him. He looked at the small boy in front of him. I know everything, he said very seriously. It was you. You took the general's revolver when no one was looking, and you carried it up to your bedroom. You waited until everyone had gone to bed except the general. You knew that he always listened to the midnight news on the radio in the dining room. You came down the stairs just after midnight, and you shot him. It was you, I tell you. The small boy laughed excitedly and clapped his hands. <laughs> Then he picked up the little metal figure of the general and began waving it around his head. Well done, Uncle! He cried. You've solved it again. That's the third Mowbray murder game you've won in a row. I don't know how you do it. Really, I don't. <laughs> It's because I'm a detective in real life. Inspector Ainsworth told him with a laugh. And you know the police always win in the end, Tommy. You two aren't playing that old game again, Tommy's mother said as she came into the room. We must have had it for years. We used to play it when we were children. Do you remember, Barry? Of course, I remember Mary. I should think every family in England had a copy of the Mowbray murder game in those days. It was a huge success, the first really popular board game. Tommy's mother picked up the little metal figure and looked at it. Poor old general, you're always the victim, aren't you? I used to feel so sorry for you. She said with a laugh. Inspector Ainsworth looked cheerful as he climbed the stairs to his office on Monday morning. He had enjoyed the evening at his sister's house, and he was very fond of his nephew Tommy. "You're pleased with yourself," the superintendent said, catching sight of the smile on the inspector's face. "I had a good weekend," the inspector replied. "Now it's back to work, I suppose. What is there today, Bill?" The chief wants to see you in his office," the superintendent told him. A few minutes later, 
Inspector Ainsworth was sitting in the chief's office. He wasn't smiling now. Mowbray, sir? Did you say Mowbray, sir? He asked. That's right. The chief said. Mowbray. You know, the Mowbray murder game. Come on, Inspector. Surely you've heard of that. The inspector took a deep breath. Of course I know the game, Chief. But I didn't know there was a real Mowbray Hall. And now you're telling me there's been a real murder there. That's correct. The chief told him. Arthur Mowbray has been murdered. I think you'd better tell me everything, sir. The inspector said slowly. From the beginning, if you don't mind. Very well. The chief agreed. We had a telephone call earlier this morning from the local police. Arthur Mowbray, the head of the Mowbray Company, was found dead at his home at about nine o'clock this morning. Where was the body found? The inspector asked. You won't like this part, Inspector. The chief said with a grim little smile. Arthur Mowbray's body was discovered in the dining room. The dining room? Inspector Ainsworth interrupted. The inspector began to feel rather strange. He felt weak and a little dizzy. He tried to concentrate. Then he asked as casually as he could. I suppose he was shot. Precisely. The chief confirmed. Again he gave a grim little smile. With his own army revolver, naturally. The inspector took a deep breath. What do we know about the victim, sir? The Mowbray story is pretty well known, Inspector. But I'll give you the background all the same. Arthur Mowbray came from a rich family. But his father lost most of the family money through bad investments. The father died when Arthur was still at university. The young man suddenly discovered that he didn't have a penny. He had the house, of course, but apart from that, nothing. What happened then? The inspector asked. He invented the Mowbray murder game. The chief explained. That was a long time ago. He made the first game himself, out of cardboard and plasticine figures. Then he thought of a clever plan for raising the money he needed to start the company. He invited another student, Lord Sheffield, to his rooms at the university to try the game out. Lord Sheffield enjoyed the game so much that he lent Mowbray £1,000 to produce it commercially. The rest is history, Inspector. Mowbray sold copies to everyone he knew. Within three years, he was a rich man. He made other board games, and the company grew from there. He paused for a moment. That's all we know at the moment, he said, except for one other thing. What's that, sir? The inspector asked. Again, the chief smiled. Just this. You are going to investigate the murder, my dear inspector. Chapter 2 Mowbray Hall Inspector Ainsworth drove to Mowbray Hall, which was 50 miles from London. He knew that he was approaching the hall when he saw a line of police cars parked by the side of the road. The inspector stopped his car and showed one of the policemen his ID. I'm investigating the case, he said. Tell me how to get to the hall, will you? You go through that gate over there, sir, the constable told him, and follow the private road. The house is about half a mile down. It's a big place, sir. You can't miss it. The inspector got back into his car and drove down the private road. Through the heart, sir. The revolver was found next to the body. There are no fingerprints on the weapon, sir, and the doctor tells us that the crime probably occurred between 8 and 9 o'clock this morning. There are no signs of burglary. That's all we know so far. Good, said the inspector. 
What do we know about the victim? Arthur Mowbray was 70 years old. His wife died 10 years ago. He lived here alone. Any relatives? The inspector asked. No, sir. The sergeant replied. There are some cousins in London, sir. The sergeant said. We don't know anything about them yet. Who was in the house when the murder took place? The inspector asked. I've got it all written down here. The sergeant said. He pulled out his notebook and began to read from it. There was Mr Larkin, the finance director of the company, Miss Markham, the marketing and sales director, and Mr Johnson, the production director, and Mr Price, he was here as well. We had a call from Mr Price at nine o'clock this morning, sir. He began. The inspector interrupted. Mr Price? Who's he? Mr Price is the company's managing director, sir. The sergeant told him. He told us that he had an appointment with Mr Mowbray this morning. Chapter 3 Money Matters Mr Larkin was a serious-looking man in his middle fifties. He was standing in front of his desk when the inspector entered his office. I'm Inspector Ainsworth, sir. The detective told him. I'm investigating the murder. And I need to ask you some questions. Yes, of course. Mr. Larkin said nervously. I quite understand. It's been terrible, Inspector, a terrible shock. Who would have thought? Such a nice man. But really... He coughed. <coughs> and made an effort to control himself. I'm sorry, Inspector. Please ask your questions. I'll tell you everything I can. I want to know as much as I can about the company and about Arthur Mowbray, the inspector said. It might help me in the investigation. Yes, I see. Mr. Larkin agreed. Well, inspector, let's start with the company finances, shall we? That's my main responsibility. Thank you, sir, the inspector said politely. The company's performance in the last year has been disappointing, I'm afraid. The director said. Revenue is down on last year, and we're facing some difficult decisions. Oh, yes, it was an informal meeting of the directors. We were all going to be there. There were one or two things that I thought we should discuss. What things in particular, Mr Larkin? The inspector asked. Mr. Larkin looked embarrassed and then said quickly, Just company matters, Inspector. Nothing that would interest the police, I'm sure. Suddenly the inspector spoke very seriously. This is a murder investigation, Mr. Larkin, he said quietly. Withholding information is a serious offence, sir. Very well, Mr. Larkin said unhappily. If you put it like that, I suppose I have no choice. Chapter 4 The Big Picture After his interview with Mr. Larkin, the inspector went to see Mr. Price, the managing director. His office was at the back of the hall on the ground floor. Hmm, about two minutes' walk from the dining room. The inspector said to himself as he knocked on the office door. I must remember that. Mr. Price opened the door of the office himself. He was a tall, thin man of about 45. He shook hands with the detective. Please sit down, Inspector, Mr. Price said. Inspector Ainsworth looked around the office. There was a large desk with a chair behind it. Papers were neatly arranged on the desk, and there was a telephone. There was a smaller table with several expensive computers on it. The inspector looked curiously at the computers. Wonderful things, aren't they, Inspector? Mr. Price said proudly. That's the world of the future, you know. The inspector laughed. <laughs> You're probably right, sir, he said. But I'm a little out of date. Was there anything special about the director's meeting this morning? No. 
Nothing I can think of, the managing director replied. It was a routine meeting, Inspector. I've just been speaking to Mr. Larkin, the inspector told him. Yes, I do, the managing director said with a laugh. He always finds some little thing in the accounts to complain about. This time it's Miss Markham's market research that worries him. He doesn't realize how lucky we are to have her in the company. She's young, but she's a real expert in her field. Let me tell you something about the company, Mr. Price suggested. Arthur Mowbray made his fortune with the Mowbray murder game. He was a gifted young man, but he didn't know anything about business. He was a dreamer, really. Brilliant, of course, but still a dreamer. Lord Sheffield was the business brains of the company. He organized everything. He made the company a huge success, not just in Britain, but in America as well. It was Lord Sheffield who went to America for the company. Mowbray always refused to go. Whenever there was a serious problem, it was Lord Sheffield who managed to solve it. I'm beginning to understand something about Arthur Mowbray, the inspector said. Mr. Larkins already told me that Arthur Mowbray didn't know anything about the finances of the company. Chapter 5 the card. Just then there was a knock at the door. Mr. Price looked quickly at Inspector Ainsworth and then called out, Come in! A young woman entered the office. She was about 30 years old, slender and dark-haired. She was dressed in a business suit. The woman stopped when she saw the inspector. I'm sorry, she said to Mr. Price. I didn't know there was anyone with you. This is Patricia Markham, Inspector, Mr. Price said. She's our Director of Marketing and Sales. The inspector stood up to shake hands with the young woman. I won't take up any more of your time just now, Mr. Price, he said. We can continue our conversation later. He turned to Miss Markham. At some point I shall have to ask you some questions as well, he said to the young woman. Patricia Markham looked at him in surprise. Me, Inspector? she asked. Of course, the Inspector told her. I want to talk to all the directors, Miss Markham. The Inspector left Mr. Price's office and closed the door behind him. He stood outside the door for a moment. G gently now. Two policemen stepped forward and began to lift the body. Something fell out of the dead man's hand. Wait, cried the inspector. He moved forward quickly and picked up the fallen object carefully with his handkerchief. He showed it to the sergeant. What do you suppose this is? He asked. It's a card, sir, the man said slowly. It looks like one of the cards from the Mowbray murder game. You know, sir, he went on, the cards with the clues written on them. Chapter 6 The Best Products It was now late in the afternoon, and Inspector Ainsworth was drinking a cup of tea with the sergeant in the kitchen of the hall. The inspector consulted his notebook. I've spoken to all the directors except Mr. Johnson, he told the sergeant. I'd better see him next. The inspector found Mr. Johnson's office empty when he got there. The office was very different to Mr. Price's. There was an untidy heap of papers on his desk, and there were charts and diagrams on one wall. There was a large bookcase full of Mowbray games. The inspector took down one of the boxes. The lid had a brightly painted battle scene on it, and the words War and Peace in large letters. 
I spent three weeks in France working on it. You painted it yourself, sir? The inspector asked in surprise. The production director laughed softly. <laughs> that surprises you, doesn't it? But I was an artist when I was a young man. That's how I started here, you see. Mr. Mowbray liked my work and he offered me a job. I was the chief illustrator at first, and then I became the production director. I illustrated all the Mowbray games, Inspector, he said proudly. That's the part of my job that I love best. Mr. Mowbray told me the success of the company was due to my paintings and illustrations. I've always been very proud of that. Mr. Johnson was right. Every detail was rendered perfectly. Mmm, it's wonderful, he said, handing the soldier back to the production director. Mr. Johnson smiled proudly. We've got some of the best craftsmen in England in our workshops here, he explained. It's been my life's work to bring them all together. But the results are worth it. I can see that, the inspector agreed. Is it possible that Mr. Mowbray was working on a new game, sir? We found this in the dining room. He handed the yellow card to the production director. Mr. Johnson looked at the card for a moment and then gave it back to the inspector. I suppose it's possible, he replied. He never mentioned it to me, but when he was working on a new game, he kept everything a secret. Chapter 7 The Conspiracy It was late in the morning when the inspector arrived at Mowbray Hall. I think I'll talk to Patricia Markham again, he told the sergeant. There are one or two things I need to find out from her. That's correct, the director confirmed. Lord Sheffield died about a month before I started work here. Mr. Price told me that Lord Sheffield was the business brains of the company. His death must have been a serious blow, I suppose, the inspector asked. Patricia Markham nodded. That's right, Inspector, she said. Arthur Mowbray was an old man. He didn't want to see that the company was doing badly. He didn't have any new ideas, you see. And when Lord Sheffield died, I think he just gave up. She paused for a moment and then went on. Miss Markham blushed. I don't know what you mean, she replied angrily. I heard you talking in his office yesterday, the inspector told her. Patricia Markham looked uncomfortable. Nothing important, Inspector, she said. We just... This is a murder investigation, Miss Markham. The inspector reminded her. I need everybody's help if I'm going to find the murderer. I'm sure you understand that. Miss Markham sighed. Oh, all right, Inspector, she said. I'd better tell you everything. It isn't what you think. Mr. Price is a colleague. We aren't... She blushed again. Go on, please, the inspector told her. Mr. Price told me about the problem he was having with Mr. Mowbray, she explained. He said the old man wouldn't consider closing the workshops. Inspector Ainsworth showed her the yellow card that had been in the dead man's hand. Have you ever seen this before? He asked. Patricia Markham looked at the card and shook her head. I don't know, the inspector told her. But I'm going to find out. Chapter 8 the inspector sees the truth. Inspector Ainsworth went back to Mr. Larkin's office in the afternoon. He found the finance director studying the company accounts. He seemed depressed. It's bad, Inspector, he confided. Very bad, I'm afraid. What will happen to the company, Mr. Larkin? The inspector wanted to know. I think we'll have to close, 
Mr. Larkin said sadly. It's bad for everybody, but there's no other choice. I've been looking at our expenses for the last few months. We can't afford it anymore, Inspector. And look at this, he said angrily. He pointed to the section of the accounts dealing with telephone expenses. Two thousand pounds on international calls in the last four months. Just four months, Inspector. I'm sorry, the Inspector said kindly. He paused for a moment. I'm afraid I have some more questions for you, Mr. Larkin. I couldn't hear what they were saying because the door was shut. I sounded very angry. Then the door of the dining room opened, and I heard Mr. Mowbray say, All right, we'll do it your way, Mr. Price. I don't like it, but we'll do it your way. That's all I heard, Inspector. What do you think they were arguing about? The Inspector asked. They'd been arguing for months about the workshops, Mr. Larkin said. Mr. Price said they were too expensive, and he wanted to close them. I imagine they were arguing about that. The Mowbray Arms pub was empty when the sergeant and Inspector Ainsworth got there at about nine that evening. It's the quietest place I could think of, sir, the sergeant said. The inspector smiled. It had been a long day, and he wanted to relax. He looked around the pub and was pleased to see that it was comfortable and old-fashioned. There were pictures on the walls, and there was a large fire in the corner of the bar. It's sad to think of, isn't it? The old man living alone up there at the hall, all the money in the world, and no one to share it with. Mm, what worries me, the inspector said, is that any of the directors could have killed Arthur Mowbray. That's true, sir, he said thoughtfully. My job's difficult enough as it is, the inspector complained. And some of them are making it more difficult because they keep lying to me. Just at that moment, a group of young people came into the Mowbray Arms. There were about 20 of them, and they were laughing and calling out to each other. The peace of the country pub was broken. One of the young men went over to the jukebox and inserted a coin. Instantly, loud music filled the bar. Another young man approached an electronic game and inserted a coin. The machine sprang into life, making strange sounds and sending bright colors around the crowded bar. The inspector frowned. Mr. Price thinks computers are the world of the future, Sergeant. That's what he told me. Chapter 9 The Suspects Inspector Ainsworth looked very determined when he arrived at Mowbray Hall the next morning. Good morning, Sergeant, he said briskly. It's going to be a busy day. I want you to ask all the directors to come into the dining room. We're going to have a meeting. Make sure that they're all there in five minutes. Yes, sir, the Sergeant said. I'll tell them now. Oh, one other thing, Sergeant, the Inspector told him. When everybody's here, I want you to do something for me. He handed the sergeant a piece of paper. Get on the phone to my office in London and ask them to check this for me, will you? Tell them it's urgent. The sergeant took the piece of paper and glanced hurriedly at it. He looked very surprised. Are you sure about this, sir? He asked. Just do it, sergeant, the inspector ordered. And bring me the answer as soon as you get it. The inspector went into the dining room and sat down at the head of the table. He watched in silence as the directors came into the room. They looked nervous and uncomfortable. The inspector stood up and began to speak. We all know what happened in this room on Monday morning, he said very seriously. 
somebody came in here and shot Arthur Mowbray. The murderer is sitting here now. The tension in the room increased. The directors looked at each other suspiciously. You've been playing a very dangerous game, Mr. Price, the inspector announced. That game is now over. Me! Mr. Price cried. You can't mean me, Inspector. I didn't kill anyone. It's ridiculous. He looked around the table at the faces of his colleagues. Everyone looked away from him. It's a mistake! He cried. You're making a mistake, Inspector. You lied to the police from the beginning, the inspector told him coldly. He looked at his notebook. You said you left your office to go to the dining room at ten to nine. When you arrived there, you saw the body. Then you went straight back to your office and rang the police at nine o'clock. That's right. That's what happened, Mr. Price said. I was telling the truth. But it only takes two minutes to walk from your office to the dining room, the inspector said quietly. I know, because I made a note of it. If you left your office at ten to nine, you should have telephoned the police at six minutes to nine, not at nine o'clock. What were you doing for those? Extra six minutes, I wonder. Suddenly, Mr. Price went very white. I. I was. I can explain, he said desperately. The inspector interrupted him. Then there's the question of your disagreement with Mr. Mowbray, he went on. You knew the company was losing money, and you wanted to close the workshops. But Mr. Mowbray was against the idea, wasn't he? He didn't want the people in the workshops to lose their jobs. Isn't that right? That's right, Mr. Johnson said quickly. You did want to close the workshops. Everybody knows that. So you began the dangerous game you've been playing, the inspector continued. The game that ended with Mr. Mowbray's death. It's not true, Mr. Price cried. You don't understand. You persuaded Miss Markham to do something for you, didn't you? You asked her to commission some market research on the company's products. You hoped that would make Mr. Mowbray do what you wanted. But it didn't work, did it? You had a serious argument with Mr. Mowbray. Everybody heard that. Mr. Price was very excited, and his voice trembled as he spoke. I wanted to hear what really happened, the inspector told him. I knew you wouldn't tell me unless you had to, so I decided to frighten you. I said you were playing a dangerous game, Mr. Price, and that's true. Chapter 10 The Arrest Inspector Ainsworth glanced at his notebook again. For a moment he said nothing. Then he looked at the people around the table. I wasted a lot of time trying to work out why Mr. Price had lied to the police. I should have been thinking more about the murder itself. Things became clearer when I started to do that. I don't see what you mean, Inspector. Patricia Markham said. Remember the Mowbray murder game? The inspector asked. It always starts the same way, doesn't it? The general's body is found in the library, isn't it? And the murder weapon is always the same, isn't it? The general's own revolver. He paused. Just like the murder of Arthur Mowbray, you see. That made me think that perhaps the person who murdered Arthur Mowbray wasn't interested in money. The murderer was interested in the games themselves. That made me think of you, Mr. Johnson. Me? The production director asked in surprise. 
You love your work here, don't you? The inspector asked. The Mowbray games are very special to you, aren't they? They're not just games to you. They're your whole life. Then Mr. Larkin gave me an idea. The inspector turned to the finance director. Do you remember what you told me about the argument between Mr. Mowbray and Mr. Price? The inspector asked. You heard Mr. Mowbray say, All right, we'll do it your way, Mr. Price. I don't like it, but we'll do it your way. You thought they were arguing about the workshops again, didn't you? Yes, I did. Mr. Larkin agreed. They were always arguing about that. The inspector looked at the production director. You also heard what Mr. Mowbray said. He reminded him. Of course. Mr. Larkin exclaimed. He looked at Mr. Johnson as well. I was in your office at the time. You heard what Mr. Mowbray said. What are you trying to say, Inspector? He asked. You're quite right, Inspector. Mr. Larkin admitted. Why did you tell me you didn't know anything about it? The inspector asked. I thought the murderer killed Mr. Mowbray because of the new game. Mr. Larkin said. I didn't say anything because I was frightened. I thought so too. The inspector told him. But we were wrong. The murderer wasn't interested in the new game at all. You knew that, didn't you, Miss Markham? Miss Markham laughed. <laughs> Surely it's time to stop all this, Inspector? She asked scornfully. Why don't you just admit that you don't know who killed Arthur Mowbray? Then we can all get back to work. I'm afraid you won't be going to work for a very long time, the inspector told her. In a few minutes, I shall ask the sergeant to arrest you for murder. This is too much, Miss Markham protested. It was a number of little things, the inspector said. I should have put them together earlier, but I didn't. I couldn't see a motive for the crime. At first, I thought the motive was greed. That made me think of Mr. Price and Mr. Larkin. Then I thought the motive might be revenge, and that made me think of Mr. Johnson. It was confusing, you see. Then I realised that the motive was greed and revenge. I can see that you know everything, she sobbed. It's true about Charles, she said. We met in England and we fell in love. We wanted to get married, but Arthur Mowbray said Charles was too young. He wouldn't even meet me. Charles was very angry with his father, and he went to live in America. He found a job there, and then he sent for me. We got married. It wasn't easy for us. I studied at the university, and I did very well. Then Charles had a terrible car accident. What happened then? The inspector asked her gently. He didn't die immediately, she explained. He was in hospital for three weeks. I wrote to Arthur Mowbray. I asked him for money to pay for the hospital treatment. He never replied to my letter, Inspector. Charles knew that his father had never forgiven him. He died unhappy. Is that when you decided to punish Arthur Mowbray? The inspector asked. Yes, Miss Markham agreed. I hated him for what he had done to Charles. Then I read in the paper about Lord Sheffield's death. I guessed that the company would be in trouble, and that gave me an idea. I applied for a job here. Arthur Mowbray had never met me, you see. He didn't know what I looked like. Did you plan to murder him? The inspector wanted to know. Yes, but I didn't just want to kill him, she confessed. I hated him, and I wanted to make him suffer. That's why I shot him with his own revolver 
like in the Mowbray murder game. But before I shot him, I did something else. Isn't that enough, Inspector? Patricia Markham said. I've told you I killed Arthur Mowbray. What else is there to tell you? Mr. Larkin told me someone was making a lot of international phone calls. He said softly. Tell me about those, Miss Markham. Patricia Markham said nothing. The inspector read it quickly. I said the motive for this crime was revenge and greed. He said. We've just been in touch with the authorities in America. They confirmed that you and Charles had a son. That's why you killed Arthur Mowbray, isn't it? Your son was his closest relative. You wanted him to inherit all Arthur Mowbray's money. The sergeant led Patricia Markham away. Inspector Ainsworth sat back in his chair, feeling very satisfied. He had solved the Mowbray murder again. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, share and subscribe to the channel to see the latest videos. Thank you.